Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you today to uh, what I believe is going to be an extraordinarily interesting conversation. We're very pleased and privileged to have with us uh, uh, Clifford May, who is the founder and president of uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a good friend of the conference, as well as uh, Robert Satloff, who's the executive director of the Washington Institute and also a great friend of the conference. And uh, joining us today, of course, is uh, William Daroff, Malcolm Holmline and Diane Loeb. And uh, with that, uh, I think we'll get started first with, with Rob Satloff. Uh, Rob, as uh, most of you know, has served since 1993 as the executive director of the Washington Institute. Uh, he's an expert on Arab and Islamic politics as well as US Middle East policy. He's written and spoken widely on the Arab-Israel peace process, the challenges of political Islam and US public diplomacy in the Middle East author or editor of nine books and monographs. He's frequently published in, uh, his views are published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and, and Los Angeles Times. And we're delighted to have you with us today, Rob. So please take it away. Great, thank you very much, author. It's very good to see everyone. Happy New Year to you all. Um, uh, Diane, Malcolm, William, and I'm very happy to be on a platform with my friend Cliff. It's, um, uh, I'm sure we'll have a great conversation. Um, uh, this, I, I've been asked, and I think Cliff and I have been asked to give a big picture view about uh, challenges and opportunities, not just in the Middle East, but, but what does the world um, anticipate? Uh, um, how, does the, how does the Biden administration anticipate the world? How does the, the world anticipate the Biden administration? Uh, challenges, that sort of thing. I think it's fair to say that Cliff and I will probably have a similar list of priorities um, there's no, there's no great, uh, as my father would say, there's no great chokmah here about, uh, you know, China um, uh, uh, um, uh, reaching a new start um, uh, agreement with the Russians, uh, other aspects of Russia, like dealing with the Russian hack, um, restoring alliances, uh, you know, reinvigorating um, friendships around the world, international organizations, climate change, and of course, Iran, uh, which is really the only um, a purposeful Middle East priority that the administration is likely to have. There will be others that will be forced upon them, but it's probably the only one um, uh, that that hits their own list of um, uh, um, uh, meaningful priorities. Um, but what I'd like to focus on for a few minutes is not so much this list, since it's pretty well known, but uh, some likely ch challenges um, uh, uh, that uh, the new Biden team is going to um, uh, will not be surprised if they if they face um, there. I mean, some of these you can go back the f opening months of almost every administration, and they happen. Uh, there will be the North Korean challenge. Uh, the North Koreans will test to find out uh, precisely where this team is in terms of uh, engagement, pressure, um, etc. Um, uh, it could come in any one of a number of ways: missile test, taking a hostage. Um, uh, all sorts of things, but there will be a, a North Korean challenge. I expect there to be a China challenge um, uh, in the sense that, uh, a very particular sense, um, uh, I'm sure the, the, the shot across the bow from Tony Blinken affirming the Bush administration's, the, rather the Trump administration's um, uh, description of, um, uh, of, of uh, uh, the persecution of Uyghurs as genocide um, will, will trigger a, a very specific reaction from Beijing. There are specific implications of, of using the genocide terminology. Um, uh, it'll be tough for the administration to avoid all sorts of, of uh, implications of, of that in terms of its engagement with China. But I bet the Chinese are gonna to wanna to find out very early on um, uh, what this means. Um, uh, 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 I suspect that uh, 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 quite apart from any desire the administration to re-engage with Iran, the Iranians are going to try to increase their own leverage vis-a-vis -vis the administration. And we already saw it in the last few days um, with, the, with the taking of a hostage by the Iranians. The Iranians have lots of means um, uh, to, to try to boost their own leverage vis-a-vis -vis the administration and force, and what they think they are trying to do is to force the administration to reach a, con a conclusion that um, uh, Washington is better off getting a quick deal because um, that's what the Iranians would like, I think, a quick deal on their terms and that the cost of pursuing a quick deal on their terms would be too high 
for Washington. And so I think we're going to see the Iranians do things in Baghdad, do things in the Gulf, um, uh, uh, as well as, as uh, we've already seen them begin things in terms of enrichment. Um, uh, uh, we'll see, I think, other challenges. I would not at all be surprised if uh, Iranian militia, uh, the Russians, the Syrians, all team up to test American resolve in a little known uh, remote outpost in Syria called Tanif, which lies across um, the, the land corridor which connects the Mediterranean to Tehran. Um, uh, 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 there's only a couple of hundred American soldiers there. Um, I would not at all be surprised to see them come under um, pressure, if not attack, in the very near term. Um, and then we're going to see, I think, challenges from some of our friends. Let's not, uh, let's not think that only our adversaries uh, can cause headaches early on. Our friends will cause headaches too. Uh, we're going to see this in Egypt, for example, where the Egyptians are, on the, um, are either about to announce, just announced um, a, uh, a, big, uh, a big deal with Russia on, uh, on acquiring uh, top flight Russian aircraft. Well, they're going to go to the top of the list for CATSA sanction discussions, which is a headache that, uh, that uh, the administration is going to have to address. Um, we're going to see exactly whether the Saudis test um, uh, how far the administration is going to go, how quickly they're going to go on, uh, on its reassessment of U.S.-Saudi relations. And, you know, let's not forget, we'll probably see some, count, some testing um, from, uh, from our friends in Israel on uh, where the administration is on settlement policy. Though I do think that just on this, and, and I'll end here, um, I do think on this issue, we're likely to see less of the testing than we would under other um, uh, um, circumstances, because in this Israeli election, the issue of settlement activity and, and uh, you know, uh, BB trying to depress the Arab vote which was the case in previous elections, that is not on the agenda this time. Uh, Bibi's in fact looking for Arab votes. He's on a charm offensive um, to Arabs. And so I think, uh, which, which we can go into, it's uh, sort of counterintuitive, but that's what's going on. Um, uh, so I think, thankfully, we're likely to see less of that sort of provocative statement in action coming from that particular friend, that particular ally, than we would normally during an Israeli election campaign. So I'll stop there and uh, let, uh, let Cliff take over. Great, thank you, Rob. So uh, we'll turn now to Cliff. Uh, I'd like to just quickly uh, update everybody on Cliff's uh, bio, which is that, of course, he's the founder and president of Foundation for Defense of Democracies, uh, which under his leadership has become one of the nation's most highly regarded think tanks and a sought after voice on a wide range of national security issues. Uh, Cliff has served as commissioner on the United States Commission on uh, International Religious Freedom, uh, which is an independent bipartisan US federal government commission that makes policy recommendations to the president, the secretary of state and Congress in order to advance the pivotal uh, right of religious freedom around the world and integrate religious freedom into America's foreign policy. And Cliff, we're delighted to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be with you, and i um, glad to be with Rob. I always learn from Rob. You'll be disappointed to hear that I have no substantive disagreements with, with anything Rob had to say, and a debate is always more fun. But let me pick up on some of the points, particularly you asked about the, the challenges and opportunities we have in this administration over the next few years. I think there are more challenges than there are opportunities. Um, let me name a few of the most significant challenges and one opportunity. In terms of the challenges, I think this administration, I understand uh, how, 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 how much they want to separate themselves from the Trump administration, but the fact of the matter is the 2017 National Security Strategy, which Trump signed, but obviously didn't conceive or write, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, is really, I would say, pretty much spot on. Now, it was undertaken um, really by H.R. McMaster as, uh, as national security advisor. I know H.R. McMaster reasonably well. We're working with him. He's the chairman of one of our three centers, our Center on Military and Political Power. Uh, 
HR is a, um, he's a soldier, he's a scholar, he has a doctorate in history, and he took this role very seriously and took the drafting of a national security strategy seriously. The, the person who held the pen on that was Nadia Shadlow. Some of you, probably many of you know her. She has an academic background, doctorate in international relations. And then a very, very important influence on this was Matthew Pottinger. He's a brilliant, interesting guy. He's a, a former Marine uh, officer. He was actually a journalist before that. He speaks fluent Mandarin. You may recall he recently made a speech to the Chinese in Mandarin. Re really remarkable guy. And, um, and uh, among other things, and very important, was this national security strategy recognized that the prevailing theory, I would say among Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, has long been that, that, that as China became wealthier, it would of course become more moderate. It would of course liberalize. Um, it would of course become a stakeholder in the international liberal rules-based order that the United States uh, created after World War II and all was gonna be well with the world. And it had become uh, evident to Matt uh, as early as uh, I think 2004 when he was working there as a journalist this was nonsense, that, the, the, that, that China was not evolving in that direction at all, that it saw it itself as a rival, an adversary, um, a determined authoritarian with, very, with ambitions beyond Asia, very much global ambitions, and we had to recognize what China had become with our help and worry about what China wanted to do in the world and how it wanted to replace us. So China is, he's, he, he saw as our main strategic threat. Russia is a, a different story. I'm an old uh, <laughs> Russianist Sovietologist, which is a little like being an expert um, in, in buggy whips, um, except that the Russian apple hasn't fallen that far from the Soviet tree, if you will. Um, and the Soviet apple didn't far, fall that far from the Russian empire tree. Uh, Vladimir Putin, and I should mention, Vladimir Putin and I went to school together. Uh, I was an exchange student at the University of Leningrad when he was there. We didn't actually hang out and chill uh, and do brewskis, but we were there at the same time. Um, and I understand him. I, th I think he is, he is not a communist, but he is a, a Soviet man in a lot of ways. And he kind of believes as a Russian that his job is the same as the job of any czar or commissar, and that is to increase Russian power. And he is revanchist and he is hostile towards the United States and hostile towards NATO. Uh, and he, he, although he has a, a rather weak hand, he has played it remarkably well, I would, I would say. Uh, he now has a warm water port in, in Syria. He's looking for uh, uh, other uh, ports probably in Sudan. Um, he has managed to uh, chop off Crimea from uh, Ukraine, which he views as rightfully part of uh, Russia. He actually has something of an argument there, but we can go into that separately. Um, and he is uh, allying himself with China. He's recently talked about the possibility of an actual military alliance with China. He is empowering, of course, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, doing a lot of bad things. So Russia is, is, is very much a problem. Now, uh, Rob mentioned, and we all know, the Islamic Republic of Iran it continues to be a problem. Um, I'm very much of the belief that the, uh, the, the, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran deal, uh, was a very good deal for the Islamic Republic of Iran, not a good deal for the U.S., and a dreadful deal for Israel and for the uh, Sunni Arab states that I would call pragmatic and friendly towards the U.S. Uh, is, uh, Iran's rulers have never acknowledged that they have a nuclear weapons program, nor have they ever promised to stop that program. What they have sort of said is there are ways in which they are willing to slow walk it in if they can be enriched in exchange. Uh, billions and billions of dollars were sent under the Obama administration. Uh, John Kerry, as Secretary of State, said he wasn't too worried. He said they have important things they want to do domestically. I'm sure they'll use the money for that. In fact, what they use the money to continue to develop missiles that carry, can carry nuclear warheads uh, to support uh, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Houthi rebels who are rebels who are outspokenly anti-American and anti-Israeli, and for all sorts of other ma malevolent things. I, I am seriously concerned about the possibility of this administration wanting to get back into that deal and, and getting out negotiated 
uh, as I think uh, Secretary Kerry did. Okay, so it's China, Russia, Islamic Republic, Iran. Uh, Non-state terrorist groups still remain a serious problem. Uh, the fact that we now, I, th I think, know pretty clearly, and I think we should, I just had a column on this, happy to send it to you, but you can find it in the Washington Times. We have, it is, it is simply a fact that the Islamic Republic of Iran has been assisting Al-Qaeda for years and years as well as the other terrorist groups. Recently, as you know, the number two uh, leader after Ayman al-Zawahiri of al-Qaeda, uh, Abdullah Ahman Abdullah, um, was assassinated. Well, what most of us presume this was done by dispatched, Israeli agents were dispatched to carry this out, largely to favor for the US because Israel's main concern is not by any means al-Qaeda. Um, last week, Secretary Pompeo gave a talk in which he ex noted that other top leaders of al-Qaeda are living freely uh, in, in Iran. And again, we're not living freely as um, Abdullah Ahman Abdullah was. He wasn't in prison or house arrest. He had a nice house in a good neighborhood. He um, had a uh, false identity as a history professor from Lebanon, and he was getting in his car when the assassins hit him. So those are four challenges. Uh, other challenges, which I'm not going to uh, talk much about, but we might want to discuss later in North Korea. Rob mentioned that. I think the UN and the international organ various international organizations are a problem because I think they are in the process long way toward, towards being essentially hijacked and subverted by China, but not just by China. The most obvious examples uh, would be the UN Human Rights Council, um, which finds uh, is you know Jews praying at the hotel to be a, a, a dastardly a violation of human rights, and China um, China's colonialism and crushing of Tibetan religion and culture not a problem. Uh, China's genocide, as Rob mentioned, uh, of the Uyghurs not too much of a problem. So where do we have a, an opportunity? Well, the uh, the Abraham Accords. This is an, a very important thing. You all know about it. I don't, we can talk about it. I don't have to say a lot, but we want to see that expanded upon. We want to. Uh, I, I think it, it, it should make a difference that Israel and the pragmatic Arab states are speaking with one voice, uh, singing from the same hymnal, if you will. Um, and I would hope that the new administration will listen to them, and because they are the ones most affected by any deals that are made um, with, with 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 Iran. One more thing I'll mention, maybe this will be provocative to you. Can the Abraham Accords lead to uh, a Palestinian-Israeli uh, settlement of the conflict? And my view on this is that, that it, it can and should, because in part, what the Arab nations that are making peace with Israel are saying to the Palestinians is, we no longer agree with you that the Palestinian cause should be defined as the destruction of the Jewish state. We think the Palestinian cause should be simply a two-state solution, meaning two states for two peoples living side by side, peacefully coexisting. I think there has been a, a for years and years, people have talked about the Palestinian cause and fooled themselves about what that phrase means. When people chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Well, we know what that means. It means Juden reign. It means uh, Juden free. It means free of Jews. And people say, "No, I'm sure that doesn't mean that." Well, of course, Hamas says that explicitly. They don't make. They don't. Uh, they don't beat around the bush. As for Mahmoud Abbas, he tends. I think he he strives for ambiguity. I think it's also clear. I think it was clear to Jared Kushner as he worked on this, and and, and to Greenblatt, and I think it's clear to the uh, to a lot of the Arab leaders. That Mahmoud Abbas, at, at the age of 85, uh, he does not intend to end his life and leave his legacy one of make, having made peace with the Israelis. That's just not what he wants. He wants his, his portrait hanging up next to that of Arafat in every Palestinian office around the world. That means he must be seen as a fighter, a warrior, a resistor. He, he not somebody who shook hands with either Netanyahu or Gantz on the White House lawn. And if he does the opposite, his portrait won't hang up. They'll be using his, uh, in offices, it'll, they'll be using it for, for target practices around the world by various Islamists and jihadis. So I think I'm over five minutes, so let me stop there for conversation and, and debate. Well, thank you for that. There's uh, a lot to, to cover. Um, we'll go to Q&A. Uh, for those of you who'd like to ask a question, kindly use the hand raise function in the app and uh, 
I will kick it off. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow the lead of, uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who announced the three biggest challenges uh, that Israel faces, what are they, he says Iran, Iran, Iran. So to, to focus on Iran for a moment, um, you know, obviously there are people who feel that uh, it was a horrible deal, the JCPOA, and got out of it for that reason, and it's a good thing to get out of it and stay out of it. Others who felt that it was a great deal, some that understand it was a, a you know, not such a good deal necessarily or doesn't necessarily apply today and see it as something um, not to go back to exactly the way it was. So now we're faced with, uh, in this administration, we've got a lot of people that worked on the deal and who've made statements uh, even more recently that, that seem to feel that it was the right deal. So what do you see? I, I heard, you know, Rob, you mentioned about, uh, you know, that Iran's trying to increase its leverage and so on to push Washington for a quick deal. So what do you predict the outcome is going to be? Do you think that there's sufficient understanding that the old terms of the deal are just a non-starter or, or do we in fact end up uh, bending to the will of, uh, of Iran and, and making a deal which resembles the one that we have? Rob, maybe you can go first. Uh, uh, you, look, you've, you've, asked, um, you've asked the critical question uh, and the Iranians get a vote in it. So it's not as though, even if I had, uh, even if Joe Biden were sitting here himself, um, he could give you an authoritative answer. Um, uh, uh, what the administration says it wants to do is uh, uh, A, consult with our partners and our allies, which itself is different, if you remember, than uh, what was the situation um, five, six years ago when uh, the outreach to Iran occurred secretly. Um, uh, so, A, consult with our, with our partners, both Arabs and Israelis, uh, and B, pursue what it calls a compliance for compliance understanding, um, which would require the Iranians to uh, return to compliance with the terms of the deal, um, uh, at which point the United States would, would uh, 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 return to the deal and uh, relieve those additional sanctions that were put on by the Trump administration. Um, it's a hell, it, even that is a lot more complicated than what I just described. Um, it's, uh, the Iranians have said um, uh, their policy is, um, uh, A, the United States first must uh, get rid of sanctions and compensate us for all the additional costs we've incurred for having been under sanctions under the Trump administration, which is, of course, you know, a bargaining position, um, uh, uh, but uh, it's where the Iranians say they are. Um, now, even if the Iranians were to um, um, uh, restore compliance with the deal, um, that, that in and of itself is a very substantial effort to, um, to unravel all the layers of uh, non-compliance, um, um, all the additional things that they've done. It would take them uh, up until at least the Iranian election this summer um, in order to do just that. And so if the, Trump, if the Biden administration says it's going to wait for Iranian compliance, we will be waiting um, at least, uh, at least uh, many months. Um, uh, the, the, the key question that the Biden team has not answered is the following. The Biden team says that its real goal is a bigger, better agreement that incorporates all of the issues that all of us know about. Ballistic missiles, Iranian um, um, uh, regional behavior, destabilizing regional behavior, you know, all the nasty things they do in the Gulf, in Syria, Iraq, with, with uh, Hezbollah, etc. cetera. Um, uh, it's a great aim. It's precisely the right aim. What the Biden administration has yet to answer, we didn't hear it in uh, Tony Blinken's testimony yet, we didn't hear it in the other testimonies, is precisely what leverage will it retain to compel Iran to make that sort of agreement once it relieves the additional pressure that would be uh, that, that that Trump added on to this equation if it achieves a compliance for compliance agreement on the original JCPOA what additional leverage and or what additional incentives would it be putting on the table so that is out there as, in my view, the big unanswered question. There really isn't a very good question, a very good answer. 
unless the team is willing in the intervening months to substantially increase American pressure on Iran everywhere else in the Middle East. Um, uh, really get, you know, but that, that would involve the deployment and the use of American force in a way that I don't think the Biden team really wants to do. So um, I, I don't have an answer to this. I think this is the key Iran focused question. Um, what additional leverage or incentive does the team consider if indeed it anticipates a bigger, broader negotiation with Iran? Thank yeah, you. I, I'm just gonna pick up on some of Rob's yeah. points and expand a little bit. I'll start with his last point, which I think is, is a very important one. You know, we, we talked a little bit about the, the, the belief for, for, you know, really going back to the 1970s that China, as it got wealthier and got more middle class, people have more money, they want more political power, more representation, their rulers or their leaders will give it to them. Again, that, that's been a prevailing kind of international relations theory embraced by most of the political elite. Okay, I think we all can agree it didn't apply to China. Does it apply elsewhere? And I think the answer is probably no. And part of the JCPOA was this idea that if we give them billions of dollars, they'll say, oh, what's our top priority? Well, we want good health care for our people. We want them to have chicken on the table a couple of times a week. We want good education. We're not going to use this money mainly to support ha Hamas and Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Houthis and to, to you know, take control of uh, Lebanon. No, they're not. Well, no, that's exactly what they were, were going to do and plan to do. And because this theory doesn't work. In other words, carrots alone don't change the behavior of authoritarians, totalitarians, people of ra with radical ideologies, which is very much what they, they are and uh, those who rule Iran. So, and if, so if, do we, does Biden still believe that that theory is operative and that's all they need to do is reward them, reward them, bribe them, seduce them, uh, give them, I, I don't know, I hope not. I hope we've, we, we, we've learned something. But if you don't have that, as Rob suggests, then you have to have not just carrots, but sticks, disincentives. You have to have um, them believing that there's a chance that they're gonna be severely wounded and hurt either by America or by Israel or by others um, if they do not go along and comply. And they're gonna be uh, tough negotiators. Now added to that is the following. I tend to think that Tony Blinken, who should is likely to be, I think very likely to be the next uh, Secretary of State is a pretty sober guy. I think Jake Sullivan, like the, the National Security Advisor, is a pretty sober guy. I'm a little disturbed that Tony Blinken is looking towards Wendy Sherman and Rob Malley as top deputies to him, with Rob Malley possibly being the uh, envoy for Iran. Wendy Sherman, uh, lovely woman, uh, she was a key negotiator way back when on the, uh, the accords with North Korea that led to North Korea not as President Clinton had predicted and hoped, uh, deciding not to develop nuclear weapons and missiles to deliver them because he was going to get all kinds of, again, same thing, all kinds of economic rewards that he'd want much more because he wants his people to live better. It was a failed agreement. Fail we had every administration is going back, you know, 25 years, uh, Republican and Democratic has failed vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, but I was failed. But Wendy Sherman failed on that. And business, when you fail in negotiations, uh, you end up saying, would you like fries with that? In diplomacy, if you fail in negotiations, you often get promoted. She went on to be a key negotiator of the JCPOA, which again, we can disagree, but I don't know what we do, I think was a, a negotiation in which it began with the premise um, uh, better have no agreement than a bad agreement. It ended up with saying, I better have a bad agreement than no agreement. Uh, Rob Malley is even more concerning to me. I think his record suggests he is sympathetic to the regime in Tehran. And I don't, you know, I don't really understand why that would be. Um, I think to have him in that role as chief envoy will be, uh, I, I think the Iranians will be popping uh, uh, open their non-alcoholic champagne over that. But I don't think it's a very it's a very good idea. I think there will be I, I think there will be some resistance to that idea. Uh, I, I hope among Democrats in the Senate as well as Republicans. Just 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 a word on this, uh, yeah. Arthur. Um, uh, 
I take a slightly different uh, view of this than uh, than my friend Cliff. I think uh, I think it's a mistake, in my view, to focus on uh, the personalities of the appointees or their um, you know what they did in the past. The key the key issue is uh, um, uh, if these are the people that have the confidence of uh, the secretary and the president, then then that's what matters. It is also um, uh, what what matters on the appointments is not is not what what Cliff was referring. It is it is to what extent do the appointments themselves send a certain message abroad um, about the direction of American policy? I mean, we all know that to a certain extent, personnel is policy, uh, but if certain appointments um, uh, uh, trigger a reaction that you don't, that, 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 that only complicates uh, your, your goal, well, that's one thing. And if certain appointments send a message that, that eases your goal, that's something else. I would I would hope that in addition to the appointments that uh, that Cliff referred to, that somewhere at a high level, there is someone um, who is a recognized skeptic on all of this, somebody who will be an address for um, for a healthy, legitimate skepticism about all this, so that even the the so that there isn't even a legitimate fear of groupthink about all this. Um, uh, this is not about the personalities individually. This is about how our allies and our adversaries will view the process of reaching decision-making on this issue. And uh, so I would hope the circle gets expanded a bit to include some real skeptics. Yeah, one would certainly hope so, because it does seem like uh, the Iranian baseball team's about to face some pitchers with very generous ERAs. So, um, okay, uh, Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from Diane Loeb. Um, neither of you mentioned Turkey in your concerns about risk, and they've clearly been supporting a lot of malign behavior in the Middle East. Could there be a test that comes from Turkey? And how do you think the Biden administration will react there and engage? Uh, Cliff, do you want to? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I think you're right. It was not, you know, it wasn't in the, the top four of challenges, but it, it should be up there. Turkey is the least reliable NATO ally we have. It's increasingly close to Russia. Um, I think it's a, a tactical more than a strategic alliance. Um, there's a possibility actually of conflict between Turkey uh, and Greece. Um, and, you know, Erdogan, I think, I'm not the first to say this about him, he's a, a neo-Ottoman. Uh, it, I think it's an interesting thing that if you look at the challenges we have, they're, uh, they're often from former empires that want to be future empires, or <laughs> in some cases like China are an empire, but want to be a grander empire. Um, Erdogan, uh, in Russia, uh, Erdogan, Turkey, uh, Putin in Russia, Xi Jinping in, in China. Um, I would say even Khamenei. It's it, he's not thinking so much of a Persian Empire, although he is. But it's a it's more a Shia Empire that would uh, build upon the Persian Empire. And, and right now, one can say that Persia has uh, Iran has more territory than any time since the Persian empires. So Turkey is a it, Turkey is a wicked problem because if you first of all we don't have a mechanism to kick them out of NATO. Secondly, you got to ask yourself: Well, if you kick them out of NATO, are you kicking them into the arms of Putin and and others? What do you do? I don't. I, I, it's a it, it's it's a, an important problem, serious problem, but a wicked problem by which I mean one to which I don't think anybody has a good uh, solution. I leave it with there to Rob. <laughs> Just a word about Turkey. Um, uh, if you go back in time, um, I think you'll see that Erdogan loves changes in administrations in Washington. He likes to be uh, the uh, the major Muslim state whisperer to new presidents. Um, uh, he was that for uh, Barack Obama. You remember that President Obama visited uh, Turkey early on. He was that to Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump loved, uh, you know, uh, he figured out how to uh, engage Donald Trump and Trump uh, loved talking to Erdogan. I think Trump, I think Erdogan is gonna go on his traditional um, uh, charm offensive in the early part of this administration. We've already seen that he's made um, uh, um, uh, some um, overtures to the Israelis, um, uh, you know, making some cooing noises about uh, 
uh, improving relations. Um, I wouldn't uh, trust this very much, but uh, it's what passes for a charm offensive by Erdogan. And so I think if I had to, you know, if I had to gauge, you know, the next six months, you know, I don't think the next six months are going to be the worst six months with Erdogan. I think that's going to come later on. Um, uh, 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 so, uh, you know, watch this space. It'll happen. I, don't, I just think it's going to happen right now. Well, let me follow up with this and ask you this question. Biden historically has been very pro-Kurdish. And being, if you're pro-Kurdish, that's, it's hard to be terribly buddy-buddy with Erdogan since Erdogan, eh, among, among the things on his to-do list is to crush, the, is to crush Kurdish, to crush the Kurds. This is all true. I would be very surprised if uh, if uh, if the word Kurd makes it into Joe Biden's briefing book anytime in the next, <laughs> you know, in the next couple of months. Uh, um, of course, the Kurds might like to try to put it in there, but uh, he's got a lot of other stuff to worry about. So again, I think this will come. I just don't think it's a today problem. Yeah, something that we've heard uh, from other experts on the Middle East that have said that uh, when posed to the question of, of Trump embracing uh, Erdogan because he likes despots, was putting, putting forward the point that what the U.S. does not need is yet another front to open up when they've got Iran to deal with China and Russia. So that's another theory that we've heard. Um, Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from Harriet Schleifer of the American Jewish Committee. Uh, yes, thank you, um, both Cliff and, and Rob. Um, we have been simply thrilled with the outcome of the uh, Abraham Accords and new friends for Israel and expanded horizons. I recently heard someone um, discuss the fact that the EU countries do not view the Abraham Accords in the same way we do, are still focused on trying to create a role for themselves in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace process. And I thought we had just been able to say that, uh, you know, all roads do not go through Ramallah. So can you comment on the possible um, American viewpoint versus a possible uh, EU viewpoint on the same situation? Rob, go ahead, sir. Um, so look, I think we're having, I, I think the, the, the move, first of all, from Trump to Biden on this issue, uh, um, there will be an evolution in, in how you view the value of uh, the Abraham Accords. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, for the Trump administration, the Abraham Accords were an affirmation that the old model um, of the Arab Peace Initiative, which is, um, uh, you know, everything will happen um, only once uh, Israelis and Palestinians finalize their peace. That model is is OB model is now uh, as uh, uh, as as Arafat once famously said, kaduk that is you know is, is irrelevant. Um, uh, I think for the Biden administration there is a is a different take and it's it's connected to what Cliff said earlier, which is yes the Abraham Accords are on the one hand good in and of themselves, even if perhaps not all of the promises um, uh, uh, President Trump made to uh, to lubricate the wheels of diplomacy. Were, were necessarily wise or beneficial to U.S. interest, but the accords are good in and of themselves. But B, they will be especially helpful if we can leverage um, uh, Arab-Israel progress um, to um, as a bridge to Israeli-Palestinian progress. That will be the innovation, I think, and I hope, of the Biden administration. This is where I think some of the, uh, the Euros are likely to come in, which is, um, you know, Abraham Accords were interesting, but they were the sideshow. They were what you did after um, uh, the UAE, you know, pulled your chestnuts out of the fire to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to drive a stake through an even worse idea, namely annexation. So let's not get so, you know, it's not such a great Trump achievement, says Europeans. Um, uh, 
um, uh, really the Trump achievement was to do something or the Trump effort was to do was to do something disastrous that thankfully the Emirates came along and saved. And now let's get back to the business of doing something rational and useful, which is address the core issue of the problem, which is the Palestinian issue, which would which is the the basic still the basic Euro approach. Um, uh, uh, we can argue and uh, my, my, my view on you know, what is the core approach? What is, that's clear. But we may have actually some convergence between Biden and Euros that what you really want to do is both build the regional, but use the regional as a way to embrace the Palestinians and not have a punitive aspect toward the Palestinians, which is the way it was seen under the Trump period. Now we can debate the, the value of the Trump peace plan and, and et cetera, but that's certainly the way it was seen is that Trump had a punitive approach to Palestinians. The uh, Biden team is coming in with a different approach. And if they can, if we can, if they can be convinced to build Arab Israel normalization in such a way that it embraces and brings Palestinians in and enhances the prospects for Israeli Palestinian engagement, and if the Euros want to play on that, more power to them. It's, a, it's only, a, that, that is a net good. Let me, I'll make a comment if I may, um, in regard to the, our European friends. Um, and I say this, uh, well, we all know it's been a difficult four years in US Euro European relations. The Europeans didn't like the way uh, Trump spoke to them, uh, Trump didn't, like the way the Europeans responded to them. And Biden, and President Biden certainly wants to restore and revitalize American European relations. To restore it from the point of view of atmospherics will be easy. But there are underlying problems there that either he will address or he won't address, but that should be addressed. Trump was not wrong to try to address them, however tactlessly he went about that. Um, the Europeans are not carrying their weight in terms of collective security, neither in terms of spending enough on defense nor having capabilities and readiness that they need to have. But it goes well beyond that. The Europeans have adopted a policy of accommodation, some might say appeasement, really towards all of our enemies. Uh, China has done all the things we've talked about, plus crushing uh, Hong Kong in absolute egregious violation of their treaty obligations with Britain and treaties are the foundation of international law. Um, the, chi the Chinese have stolen billions of dollars worth of intellectual property. They're, they're, the Belt and Road Initiative, we could do a whole session on. What, what has been the European response? Well, China uh, has been voted on to the U UN Human Rights uh, Council and there is a new uh, economic uh, agreement that has been approved, not ratified between Europe and China. In other words, you're, the Europeans are not planning to do anything tough about China. Uh, as to Russia, the, it wasn't just the Trump administration that disapproves and disapproves of going ahead with Nord Stream 2, which will make Germany and Europe more dependent on Russian energy than ever. Uh, the Europeans uh, complain constantly they are still certain Britain, France, and Germany in the JCPOA with the Iranians. So when the Iranians violate it, as they have on repeated occasions, they, if they're still in it, they shouldn't be violating it. Most recently, they announced they were going to uh, produce uh, uranium metal. And the Europeans uh, said, really, we urge you uh, not to go ahead with this. In other words, the Europeans are doing nothing uh, constructively uh, about our, what, what they should see as our, our common enemies. Also, the Europeans have gotten very used to bashing the Israelis and being angry at the Americans. If they stop doing that, who are they going to get angry at? Who are they going to bash? <laughs> they would have to turn on people they don't want to turn on because they are, they are serious. And so I, I, I would like to see the Europeans be helpful in, in, this, in, 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 in moving the, uh, the Abraham Accords from a, a, a sort of settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict to a settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict but nothing in recent history suggests they will. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Good diplomacy, um, Biden's efforts may go in the push in that direction, but for now the Europeans are, 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 are just, are not being very, have not been very helpful, I would say. Sad but true. Uh, Rachel, next question, please. Next question is from Bob Sugarman. Bob. 
Bob, you're still muted. You, there you go. I think I'm okay now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've read in the last couple of weeks uh, of uh, settlement initiatives that have been uh, put put out by the uh, uh, Israeli government. Um, are these the prime minister's election campaign, or is it something more difficult to deal with? And how do you expect the Biden administration, which views settlements, I think everybody will agree on a much different basis than the, the Trump. How do you think the Trump, uh, the Biden administration will uh, deal with that? Thank you. Uh, so there's been, hey Bob, so there's been um, uh, a number of different things that um, uh, the Israeli government has been pursuing on this issue in the last few days. Um, uh, uh, some of this is, um, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of regu regular order of business of settlement growth. Uh, and there has been, um, you know, a few hundred uh, units that have um, been approved and have I don't really know the detail of which stage of the of the approval process. You know, this is a, the Israelis are quite masochistic in this, where they have so many stages of, of, of approval that each one of them, you know, earns them bad news for for the same building, for the same apartment building, and it's it's um, uh, uh, it's uh, just a um, self defeating um, policy. In any case, so th there there was some there's some of that. I think the, the, the more um, uh, provocative measure that, uh, that uh, um, looks like is not happening um, was the, the attempt to legalize a number of remote um, outposts, what, what would be illegal outposts that uh, um, uh, uh, Netanyahu wanted to get legalized um, uh, and Gantz um, uh, um, uh, objected um, uh, in, in, as of the last thing I saw is that it didn't, is that it just, it's not happening. Now it may happen. Um, these things can sometimes happen very quickly. Um, uh, but he wanted it to happen while Trump was still in office. Um, uh, so that the reaction would not be, you know, there wouldn't be a, an immediate visceral American reaction. Um, uh, 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 that doesn't look like it's happening at the moment. Um, to put this in the sort of political context, um, uh, uh, Netanyahu's main political challenge um, is not on this issue in this election. Um, his main thrust is uh, to get Israelis vaccinated, and his campaign is based um, 110% on the on the platform that um, um, I'm the guy who's making Israel the first um, country in the world to defeat COVID. And, and his goal is to get, I think it's 4 million Israelis vaccinated by election day. Um, and uh, he believes, he evidently believes, I don't know exactly what he believes, but um, it, he is ascribed to believe that achieving that goal will secure victory for him. And if you look at the polls, you know, in fact, uh, the polls have moved um, uh, in his direction um, uh, in the last uh, in the last 10 days. Decreases for his... Uh, uh, his competition and and uh, increases um, for his party. And I, and I agree with Rob. I'm not going to uh, repeat anything you said. I, I will make this point because I think it's important to have in the, in the back of your, of your mind. Um, as the, as President Obama was uh, leaving office for just a little over four years ago, you may recall, he allowed or perhaps even facilitated a UN Security Council resolution that was just a disastrous hit against Israel. Uh, it essentially said that, the, that Jews, Israelis, have no right even to be in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. They have no right to pray at the Kotel. They have no rights whatsoever. And, they, and that was a message to the Palestinians, do not compromise, because we're saying if the Jews have no right to be in the, old, <laughs> in the Jewish quarter, if they have no right to be at the Kotel, they have no right to be anywhere, right? So, you know, hang in there. We're with you. With, uh, if the Palestinian cause means the destruction of Israel. That was just a dreadful thing to do. None of our European friends opposed it. None of them were gonna were saying, you know, would stand up for, for, for Israel and, and say that's, that's just ridiculous. Um, the most, you cannot nullify 
uh, or repeal a UN Security Council resolution, so it stands. But moving the embassy to Jerusalem was an important signal because it said, okay, the Israelis have a right to be in Jerusalem. They have a right to be to have a homeland. We are going to reaffirm that. I'm confident, more than hopeful, confident, the Biden administration is not going to go back on that. They're going to have uh, essentially an ambassador to the Palestinian territories, as we had in previous administrations. Um, how that'll be uh, constructed and housed, I'm not sure. Maybe Rob knows, but I don't think they'll go back on that. And maybe we get a little bit beyond that. But I, I listen. I certainly hope that Biden doesn't decide he wants to reinforce any of those. I would say anti-Israeli gestures of the previous administration. And by the way, that's another variable in all this. We should just keep in mind. Biden will have all these various advisors. We've talked about Jake Sullivan and, and, and um, Tony Blinken and others. Um, John Kerry will be in the White House, uh, although for climate change. But Barack Obama didn't go back to Chicago or Hawaii. Most presidents leave town after they're done. He's still here. He can still get on the phone. He can still take a car over. To what extent will he say, Joe, here's my advice. I hope you'll take it. To what extent will President Biden either say, yes, you're right, boss, or say, well, that was your policy. I'm president now. I'm doing it my way, but I appreciate the counsel. We just don't know the answer to that, but it's important. I think it's an important question. So if I could just yeah, oh, add one, um, one thought on this issue, because I think it's useful for, for uh, the Conference of Presidents to, to uh, keep this in mind. Um, uh, one of the um, to, w w one of the key innovations of uh, President Trump, which um, uh, 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 which took U.S. policy on this issue in a in a totally new direction, was to say, um, uh, 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 not not only are you know so are are the presence of some Israelis in the West Bank legitimate. And we won't be party to the to the idea of demonizing all Israelis in the West Bank, but it was the Trump administration policy that all Israelis in the West Bank were legitimate, and that none of them would ever have to move to accommodate a peace agreement. It was stretching that principle to its to as far as the, as the eye could see. Now, elections have consequences, and the Biden administration is not going to endorse that principle. It, 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 will, it will much more likely go back to a different, more middle ground principle, differentiating between um, uh, uh, settlements and settlers whose presence is non-objectionable to the cause of a two-state resolution to the conflict, and settlements and settlers whose presence is purposefully objectionable to achieving that resolution. Uh, I think we should recognize that what Trump put in place will be complicated to unravel because it's not every day that a, 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 an administration says that was what, what was legitimate is no longer legitimate. But it's also, I think, too much to expect that there won't be that shift in American policy. And so helping the administration do this in the most constructive way, in a way that doesn't add to the provocations, I think is very, you know, is very useful. We should be, I think, quite understanding of an administration that is going to take what was that unusual Trump principle and bring it into what I hope is something that is more constructive than where it was than, than where Cliff just referred to, namely at that UN Security Council resolution in the last month of the Obama administration. There is a more constructive position that I hope the Biden administration can take on this issue. Um, so to our final question, we go to William Daroff. William? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Cliff and Rob. And uh, we only have a few moments left. I want to shift to another subject that hasn't come up, which is uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the president uh, during the campaign uh, famously talked about uh, the Saudis being a pariah uh, state and about there being a shift in the way that uh, the administrations are dealing with, with the Saudis. Uh, in the meantime, there have been some uh, actions taken by MBS. Uh, the Crown Prince uh, 
presumably to try to make nice uh, with the Biden administration, the, uh, the opening to Qatar, uh, reduction in executions, uh, reducing the oil prices, uh, the textbook reforms and the like. Uh, I wonder, and, and obviously the Saudi, Saudi engagement is incredibly important uh, as it relates to the sort of Sunni-Israel alliance and, and the future of this. I wonder how you see this playing out. I'll be, I'll be glad to start. I find, I, I got to say, I find Saudi Arabia fascinating and we could really do, we could easily do an hour on Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Um, it's an authoritarian country um, for sure, um, in which the, the, the crown prince it has increasingly been opening up in terms of certain rights, not in terms of his control, but in terms of, of certain rights. And it, Saudi Arabia has a relationship with Israel at this point, that is extraordinarily consequential. They are not part of the Abraham Accords, but I'm, I'm telling you, I don't think Rob will disagree, He's welcome, that the Abraham Accords could have come about with unless there had been Saudi tacit approval of them. Uh, it is more complex for the Saudis to, to join the Abraham Accords. We can talk about why, although I don't think that's impossible to happen over time. Uh, very important that the Saudis do not want at this point to see Israel erased from the map. Uh, the Saudis have committed terrible crimes. Khashoggi is the most visible and noticeable one. Um, but uh, a lot of the people who are concentrating on that uh, sort of brush aside the crimes of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I have a, a report not that long ago from Britain found that 14 uh, Russian uh, defectors and dissidents had been killed, probably under Putin's orders, on British soil over, over recent years. So keep in mind, it is a jungle out there. It is not a global village. Um, and the Saudis play an important role. They have been attacked by Iran using uh, money that, that, w that in, in part that we gave them, since that money is fungible. Half their uh, oil, pr oil production facilities were taken out. They were restored remarkably quickly. Um, the Saudis uh, are not good guys, but they are at this point pragmatic guys. And I have to tell you, I, the Saudis I talk to in important positions, I, I, although I always listen to Saudis with a, a, a grain of salt, uh, they have seemed to me to be sincere in saying, look, we understand what, that what we did in terms of spreading jihadism was a dreadful mistake. As one put it to me, we created a Frankenstein monster. It attacked you, but it has attacked us. And we do understand at this point that Al Qaeda and similar groups are common enemies of, of, of us and, and of you. Now, again, this is a much longer subject and a fascinating subject, but the, I, I throw that out there for, for Rob to join. Yeah, um, uh, this is indeed a very, um, uh, both important and urgent policy issue, and one of the most complex. Um, uh, I mean, from a Saudi perspective, a Saudi charm offensive um, includes things that people in Washington might not even see as a charm offensive. So from a Saudi charm offensive, um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the verdict against um, uh, women activists um, is a, um, uh, is, is, is a um, uh, where, you know, where they got uh, um, uh, convicted, um, mostly time served, et cetera. Um, that's viewed as, as a, um, a sign of great magnanimity. Um, uh, in Washington, um, that's viewed largely as another slap in the face um, uh, and not really um, something that merits, um, uh, you know, applause or cheering. Um, so we, we still don't actually talk to each other in, uh, and use the same words and the same language and the same meaning. There's a real divide here. Uh, there's still a divide about Yemen policy, which, which, has, which has huge bipartisan support on Capitol Hill in order to turn off American um, uh, resupply to the Saudis, even though the Saudis themselves have suffered um, uh, essentially what the Israelis suffer from Gaza with, you know, with all these rocket attacks on, on civilian targets. Um, I will just, I mean, it's a big picture. There's a lot of pieces to this. I just want to emphasize one thing that Cliff said. To me, the biggest piece of the Saudi story is that the Saudis are getting out and have gotten out of the global extremism business. This is the main objective of US, should be 
the main objective of U.S. foreign policy. Um, it was uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, one of the worst contributors to a generation in which we saw the global rise of radical Islamic extremism, thanks in no small part to Saudi investment in radical institutions around the world. Um, and, and I think this conference knows precisely what I'm talking about. Getting them out of that business once and for all, completely and totally, a process which is now underway, I believe, is huge. And we need to keep our eye on that prize. It is not easy to do that, given the, the, the certain decisions of the Saudi leadership. Um, uh, and we ha they have to be held, there has to be a measure of accountability, both personal and institutional for that. I hope we do not, le uh, we do not um, lose sight of the fundamental and overriding strategic objectives that we have, and that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater um, in terms of the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Thank you, and I also hope that uh, that we apply the same logic that the principal foreign policy objective needs to be to get the Iranians out of the business of international terror and mayhem. So. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Cliff, for your erudite responses. It was really a pleasure uh, and, and enlightening to have you with us today, as always. And uh, going to our topic that we started with, the challenges and opportunities. May we overcome our challenges and may we achieve our opportunities, fulfill them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank, Amen. You. thank you, Cliff and Rob. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye. Stay safe and healthy. Miranda.